with this. And for me, where one of the boundaries that I draw with that is, well, an activist is not necessarily interested in what the truth is as much as they're interested in what the narrative is. Um, and this kind of thing, particularly in that postmodern sense of it. I've said many times that one of the reasons I focus on what's going on at the universities is because, well, that's where we train the next generation of scientists, right? And it's also oftentimes where a lot of research in the United States, but also in Canada and in a number of other uh, countries, often where a lot of scientific research is done. And so I think it becomes quite relevant to have a good look at what's going on and to consider some things that might be causing problems, of course. And of course, one of the biggest ones that I've been hyping on for a while now is the notion of the politicized university, and particularly with postmodernist influence and all of that jazz that is uh, that is as nasty as it is, unfortunately. So this came across my radar. It's actually been out for a little while, but it was a really fascinating piece um, against scholar activism. And again, one of the things that seems to be suggesting trust in universities has gone down has been the tendency for more activism uh, rather than rather than uh, focusing on inquiry. And I like this piece because she actually gave a very distinct and good boundary between activism and inquiry. And I, I, but there's one critique I have of it right off the jump. Um, this is coming from the James G. Martin Center for Academic Renewal, which is at Princeton University. Um, <clears throat> one of the things I've had a critique of with this is that she's using activism and advocacy somewhat interchangeably. Um, and you can see it actually right here in the top line. Against scholar activism, neither faculty nor staff should allow advocacy to eclipse inquiry on campus. Now, I don't actually use act I don't agree that activism and advocacy are exactly the same thing. Yes, both of them have things to do with agendas in this case, but where I disagree is activism well tends to be my narrative uber alles regardless of whether or not it is in line with any amount of evidence, whereas an advocate might actually consider evidence that contradicts their claims and perhaps adjust their claims accordingly. So <clears throat> there's a big difference there in that in that particular aspect, but advocates um, tend, tend to also have agendas in my conception of it. Um, and activists also do, but tend to not really care if there is, um, not really care exactly what the truth is about something, um, as much, which is what makes it so opposed to the purpose of inquiry and truth seeking that is the telos of a university, um, and the telos of science for that matter. So let us get into that. <clears throat> The rise of political orthodoxy on campus is often cited as one of the key reasons for reforming universities. But if there is a rise of orthodoxy, what does this rise, uh, this orthodoxy look like? Who is perpetrating it? On what grounds are they doing so? Professors might immediately want to point out to, that universities are known for being open environments of intellectual, academic, and expressive freedom, which supports their core mission to create and disseminate knowledge, i.e. truth-seeking. They might also wish to take issue with the idea that faculty members push an orthodoxy, as it's common for students or students' parents or activist groups are re reviewing course syllabi to assume they are engaging in advocacy simply because they are teaching material that challenges cherished beliefs or questions about uh, or questions unexplained assumptions, unexamined assumptions. Excuse me. A creationist might see an evolutionary biologist as pushing a message, and a young man might experience a lecture on the history of sex discrimination as X grinding. The Center for Better North Carolina argued in 2003 that assigning a student's Barbara Ehrenreich's book about poverty, nickel and dimed, constituted indoctrination. People do not always understand that studying a subject, inquiry, is distinct from promoting an agenda. And I will actually swap this out to say activism, just writ large with that. But anyway, because I think that is actually, in my conception of it, what she's pointing to. But... But this is a distinction I do want folks to take away from this. And I am so actually very glad that's brought up there because one does have to keep in mind that just because someone studies a subject, it doesn't mean that they're particularly promoting a policy agenda or are related to that subject or promoting an agenda at all. They may just be very interested in truth seeking related to that subject. Um, and so you do have to be quite 
careful to not tar everybody in the discipline just because a few happen to go down the activist <laughs> route rather than uh, continuing to be great scholars. But it's not all misunderstanding. Some professors actually describe themselves as scholar activists. I have seen this too. Teaching a contentious ideological position, not as a subject for critical examination, but rather with the intent to dogmatically advocate for it in the hope that students accept it as true, represents an abuse of the influential position instructors hold over their students. The activist instructor often justifies her demagoguing on the grounds that the university should be helping improve our democracy. She sees her politics as doing just that. Inspired by scholars from John Dewey to Angela Davis, she frames her activism as advocacy for democratic principles. University, uh, university instructors, in this view, ought to, to be contributing to social justice and democratic ideals, and not just on their free time. For if the university is touted for promoting democracy, then it can seem perfectly justifiable to use one's paid job to advocate. Now, at this juncture, I want to remind readers of, uh, listeners here, of one thing that I've talked about before, that others have talked about, and it's the idea of a telos. Telos is ultimate purpose, in that what is the ultimate purpose of a thing, of a person, of an object, of an institution, all that kind of jazz. What is the ultimate purpose of it? You can only have one ultimate purpose, um, to put it bluntly, because the minute you have two competing teloi, or teloi, or however you pronounce that, um, you're going to find eventually a situation where you have to put one above the other um, <clears throat> in those things. So you can only really have one ultimate purpose um, for an institution. And so that's, that is the question to ask yourself when you're thinking about this. What is actually the ultimate purpose of a university um, in this particular thing? And I have said it before, what my telos and thinking in telos is, is the pursuit of the truth the knowledge dissemination, which I believe, yep, which the core mission to create and disseminate knowledge. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Another subset of instructors eager to avoid being seen as pushing an ideology do little more than let students exchange uninformed opinions, a practice Stanley Fish once described as, quote, an exercise in self-indulgence inevitably couched as, an interac as interactive learning or engaged learning or ethical learning. The instructor who gives her class over to the exchange of opinions justifies the approach either on the grounds that she should treat all opinions equally, lest she be a logic bully who expects people to follow the evidence wherever it leads, or on the grounds that exchanging opinions or advocating for political positions is training students, uh, is training students need to become, what the, is the training students need, there we go, to become engaged uh, citizens in a democratic society. Yeah, that's, the reverse is just as bad. Just let them all run run wild. You're not actually teaching them such things about how to think or examine evidence or actually be inquiring on something. Whether or not these positions are rooted in an accurate understanding of sophisticated thinkers such as John Dewey, Angela Davis, Michel Foucault, Martha Nussbaum, Cornell West, and Amy Goodman, Dennis Thompson, and others is an important question for another essay. Suffice it to say here that both sets of instructors tether their practices to a questionable idea about how the university serves democracy, and neither the student whose instructor pushes a political agenda, nor the student whose instructor engages encourages the simple exchange of opinions, gets a rigorous education. But as I and others have noted, much of the pushing of ideology on campus comes not from faculty members, but from university administrators and support staff members who see themselves as promoting certain values and, yes, advancing democracy through their work at the university. As Jeff Streitzel and Rishi Sriram described tautologically in their 2021 article outlining a scholar-practitioner activism for student affairs professionals, quoting from them, Social justice activism is an expectation of the student affairs profession because the social justice and inclusion competency necessitates action on the part of the student affairs professionals to help create a more just society. What is a more just society would be the question there. The act, this active orientation should include using the tools of research and scholarship to advocate for change. So... If you guys are following along on this channel for long enough, you know that one of the normative principles 
of science is disinterestedness, meaning that when you are doing your research, you do not carry any particular particular interest of yours with you, which is to say you do your work in the pursuit of the truth without regard to what you would prefer to see. You are not trying to get what you prefer to see out of your study. You are trying to get what the truth is. This is kind of the opposite of that, where you actually have interestedness, and it doesn't necessarily lead to the best research. The authors explain that, quote, research findings can help practitioners advocate for needed change. At the same time, these student affairs professionals are told to produce the scholarship they need for their activist agenda. That is expressively interestedness, not disinterestedness. The Association of Higher Ed Students Affairs Administrators has, for years, offered a rubric for social justice competency among students affairs professionals. It states, quote, Student affairs professionals may incorporate social justice competencies into their practice through seeking to meet the needs of all groups, equitably distributing resources, raising social consciousness, and repairing past and current harms on campus communities. To be sure, the student affairs staff play an important role in helping students who live and learn in close quarters, despite ideological and lifestyle differences, to comply with regulations and laws so they can succeed in school and not become a barrier to others' ability to do the same. But when employees engage in raging, raising consciousness and repairing past and current harms on campus, they cross the line from acceptable and worthy facilitating to catechism. Some college students are surely, uh, well, yes, some, some college students are that, but it is not the job of student affairs professionals to change their beliefs and feelings only to steer their actions to comply with law and policy. Likewise, the activist effort to engage in comp compensatory, compensatory, yeah, compensatory, there we go, educational efforts to repair past harms could rationalize all sorts of intolerance, censorship, and arrogant bullying. Indeed, it is not the job of a student affairs professional to engage in social justice just to help students comply with law and university policy. That's it. During my time as a professor, I faced this blurring of the boundaries between in inquiry and advocacy, again, meaning activism here, multiple times. In one case, my sociology students had a guest presentation organized by what was then called the LGBT Center. A panel of several people came to class for a discussion of LGBT issues. My students, having learned to engage in inquiry and debate, asked the panelists a number of critical, but not harassing or discriminatory questions. The panelists, evidently expecting to walk in and enlighten my students with their lived experience, later complained that my students were hostile. Clearly, there was a clash in expectations. The guest panelists wanted to advocate. My students wanted to inquire. Now, at this juncture, I want to take a moment and say bravo to the professor for teaching her students about inquiry and debate. That is actually the right thing that students need to know, particularly if they want to go into a STEM discipline or to a social sciences discipline and make a difference there um, <clears throat> and the like. So I applaud that. Uh, that is an excellent, excellently done thing on the part of that professor. Uh, and those panelists should be expecting that if they go around to the universities, but clearly they were not. Later, when I coordinated the many sections of the required academic first year seminar course, I received numerous requests from student affairs professionals seeking access to the FYS first year seminar classes for advocacy purposes, activism again. When I served on the university's Interpersonal Violence Council, some people wanted to give academic course credit to students for completing their sexual assault prevention training. I don't know if such people mistook their trainings for academic material but it was clear they wanted to incentivize students to take them. The academic curriculum was useful for their purposes. This is not unique to the institution where I worked. Whenever the university is seen as a home for activism, I, I swapped out the word there for that, advocacy, we see advocacy encroaching on inquiry. Inquiry with all its questions, needs ev need for evidence, assumption of the value of examining an issue from multiple perspectives, and encouragement of feedback and debate, gets in the way of advocacy's needs for making judgments, disclosing feelings, discuss, dismissing minority views, and urging courses of action. This is actually one of the things I was 
looking at here with this in terms of the uh, in terms of the difference between inquiry and activism um, in particular because you know if you're inquiring about something you are going after the truth you're going with questions you want evidence assumption you know gonna examine something from multiple perspectives you're gonna look at look at the feedback and debate part of it and want the feedback and debate part of it um, but it does get in the way of an activist narrative to do that. <laughs> That's why they're not necessarily compatible. <clears throat> Fact of the matter, I would just go say they're not compatible. I would argue that the problem of orthodoxy is worse among the staff than the faculty. Scholars who privilege political criteria, criteria over academic ones are more obviously violating the standards of their profession, whereas activist criteria are baked into the professional standards of the student affairs profession. The preparation scholars receive is fundamentally rooted in curiosity driven to find knowledge, while the preparation student affairs professionals receive is more likely to be rooted in advocacy. And you should read, I'm reading that as activism um, because of the way this article is written, but anyway. <clears throat> but the larger point is that those who think neither faculty nor staff have any business pursuing political agendas on their employers or the taxpayer's dime should be cautious of efforts to make supporting democracy the mission of the university. Well-meaning efforts to improve democracy through the university, be they from faculty or staff, from internal or external constituents, or from the political left or right, can lapse into efforts to compel instructors and students to espouse certain ideas or to prevent them from teaching or learning certain material. Attempts to reform universities by making funding contingent upon new requirements and metrics can easily get used by university actors to justify spending more time and more money and time on the very initiatives that reformers dislike. Given the way in which promoting democracy works for scholars who fancy themselves activists and for activists who fancy themselves scholars, new initiatives to better serve democracy might just be what the activists ordered. Yes. And this is this is the fundamental challenge, right? Um, now, here's the thing. I always view the university and STEM science more broadly as it's telos of pursuing the truth. Okay. Does that support democracy? Does that support the republic that the United States is, for example? Yes, it does. If it is faithful to working in reality and pursuing the truth, then what does the knowledge generation that universities do? It provides the necessary guidance and what is actually true about something for to eventually inform policymaking, at least in part. Now, why do I say at least in part? Because when you get to the point of policymaking, you are talking about multiple competing interests and frankly, knowledge dissemination is only one of those things that informs policy, such is the case. But <clears throat> That does not mean that cannot be the purpose of the university. The purpose of the university is the pursuit of the truth in this. And it should be, it should be quite cautious when you start changing the mission of the university to something that itself has a political agenda tied to it, rather than the inquiry that comes with pursuing the truth. Uh, <clears throat> For example, as North Carolina universities take up the call to better prepare students for engaged citizenship in our democracy, we might see more rather than less confusion between inquiry and ac ac advocacy. Blah, blah, blah. The UNC system proposal to give all UNC system students a shared foundation in the principles of American democracy could result in conflicting politicized approaches to preparing students to thoughtfully participate in democratic process in the democratic processes of the state and nation. I do not oppose universities engaging in research, artistic, and learning experiences that inquire into democracy and citizenship. And of course, many university staff members embrace and support the university's mission, including many of those whose work helps their campus comply with anti-discrimination laws. I am simply suggesting that the confusion between advocacy and inquiry indicates a need for universities to clarify their purpose. When democracy and social justice goals become the point rather than secondary outcomes of the university's mission, advocacy can trump inquiry. And again, I will state activism can trump inquiry, which is not the purpose of the university. And that is the point here with this, that I wanted to bring this up. There are some boundaries there between inquiry and activism. 
with this. And for me, where one of the boundaries that I draw with that is, well, an activist is not necessarily interested in what the truth is as much as they're interested in what the narrative is. Um, and this kind of thing, particularly in that postmodern sense of it. But I will leave it there and let you all stew on it, actually, uh, and answer the question for yourself. What for you is the telos, the ultimate purpose of a university? What is the telos, the ultimate purpose of uh, science? Leave, leave, I'd be curious. What's your answer to that question? Um, and of course, this will be linked in the comments for you so you can read it yourself and think about it and decide. Uh, 